Thank you, Shroud, and thank you, folks at home or wherever you may be, for tuning that dial to the Eek channel. My name is James, and I'm joined by my co-host to the right, Cody, and my co-host to the left, Danny. If you're new to the show, the first half is us just discussing a horror-related topic, and then we will take a break in the middle and go watch a scary movie. After that, we'll come right back with our hot takes and immediate review to determine if the movie gets the original Eek seal of quality. This is episode 14 of Eek Cast, and today we are discussing Stephen King. (laughs) I love Stephen King. All right, so Stephen King, uh, his books have sold over 350 million copies. It's because he's written 350 million books. He has, 50, <laughs> <laughs> he has 58 novels, okay. over 200 short stories, 46 films adapted from his stories, 30 TV series adapted from his stories, and then 17 film or TV sequels that are sequels to the adaptations that don't have books. Unbelievable. It's just crazy. Dude, uh Gonna read that last little phrase? Oh yeah, he's won at least. This is just the ones that I could track down sure. from different organizations. He's won at least sixty-four awards for his work. He's everywhere. I mean, these awards, no matter how minor or major, I mean, they're in film, they're in shorts, they're which kind of find these hybrid. They're they're in books. Mm-hmm. I mean, unbelievable, inescapable. What? Inescapable. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. What? Un. Believable. That's what I said. <laughs> Inescapable. <laughs> oh, gosh. Sorry. Please. Yeah, so uh, going down the Rotten Tomatoes top five. So the top five Stephen King works on Rotten Tomatoes, judging by their uh, percentage uh, fresh score. Uh, number one was Carrie, then Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, The Dead Zone, and Gerald's Game. Are we are we talking about that? Are we are we moving? We're coming back. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll come back. Okay. Um, okay. So, well, first we'll just say that makes the top five at least freshness on the Tomatometer Meter. meter. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. And uh, I that's a fairly fairly recent move. In twenty seventeen, I think. Right. Um. So that's pretty cool. Uh. And then just I also just did kind of an aggregate review or a uh, average. Yeah. Of every single thing that has. A Rotten Tomatoes rating. Yeah. And so the average review score of Stephen King adaptations is 48%. That's so really interesting. So I, yeah. I think it's important to remember Stephen King isn't making films. Exactly. Right? Like he, he writes the stories that inspire the films. He writes, uh, has he been involved in screenplays? We'll get into that later. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's just important, like... Let's not necessarily judge Stephen King yeah. by film adaptations. Also, I, I can't say that I've... I mean, that production number is huge. So I'm not going to sit here and say... So that's 48% average, and there were 59 entries. Which is... I'm, I'm not going to say I've even seen half. No, I, was, I, maybe, I was say, I've probably seen the least of these of any of you. Do you think... That's a pretty accurate as far as from what you've seen, just as a pre-assessment. We're speaking strictly on film. Sure. Because, right. <clears throat> excuse me, I have not read any of his books. Yep. So, again, like I am, I guess I am Rotten Tomatoes. I am judging Stephen King through film. Perfect. Um, That's what we're here for. I would say... A, this is a horror movie podcast, yeah, not a yeah, horror yeah. book podcast. I, I, yeah, yeah. We don't need oh, no okay. books. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Reading is really important. I used to work at a bookstore. Read more books. Read more books. Buy yeah, books. Yeah, support your local bookstores. Like yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would say, to start off, you always have to understand, like, Stephen King novels, um, from, from what I understand, again, 
I haven't read any of his books. I've seen his books. They're huge. Mm-hmm. I would imagine it's very difficult to create a a feature film out of that. A two-hour yeah. feature film. That's why in the 90s it was so hot to make a Stephen King miniseries. Yep. The Perfect Storm. If you listened to last week's episode, you heard my wife's, I think, I hope it came up, her favorite or her most memorable scary flick that she watched was actually in youth group during it was, they just played the miniseries like six hour miniseries. <laughs> hey, forget God. Let's watch a Stephen King miniseries yes. and uh, the perfect storm. Um, is that right? The perfect, the perfect. No, no, that's not right. Storm of the century. That's it. sorry. Uh, no, perfect storm. Different movie. Very different. Uh, storm of the century. And so that is probably what it would take to kind of do his stories justice. Yeah. I mean, um, same thing with uh, it, Salem's lot. Yeah. Um, those are all that I can think of off the top of my head. There's a few others. Um, they're, they're all, and it's confusing today. Cause if you weren't alive at that time, you don't know how those TV mini series worked. <laughs> like you're just like, Oh, Salem's lot. I've heard that's a good movie. And you look at it and it's four hours long. It's yeah. like, wait, what the, what? Like, no, I'm, I'm not watching this. When when <laughs> when do I have time? <laughs> Quit my job. Watch this. Watching all the Stephen movie. King yes. movies. Yes. Um, so yeah, that that absolutely is a real thing, and it's actually really interesting to see how many of his adaptations um, are adapted as feature films from the short stories. So yeah. a great example of that is Stand by Me. Yeah, is just a short story that was in. One of his books, or I always forget one. I think it's the ones about dreams or something. Yeah, dreams and I, somethings. I know it's called the body. Yep, like the, his body's is the, the body. The story. Yep. yep. Um, and so yeah, that was adapted from a short story. Uh, the Green Mile yep. is a series of short stories. So yep. actually, if you look at, the, I think they probably have like a a hard cover that has all of them in one bound edition. But like the Ooh. original way that it was released, were like just these like really tiny little like Reader's Digest books really yeah they're like little reader digest paperbacks and i think there's five or seven of them and that was the green mile that's really cool yeah. so some of stephen king's shorts we actually read in my high school english mm. but they were just like you know they would just hand out a packet and you right. just read them but that's really the only written work i've ever experienced of stephen king is some of his shorts really cool we read the body it's mm. very cool it, yeah you know they take some liberties and stand by me, but right. you have to for a short. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like a lot of his, a lot of his stories. Clearly, again, I can't verify this. I can't go to both sources and say yes, I've read and I've watched. But they have some pretty major twists. And when you take a seven hundred page book, and and a kind of a slow burn twist is coming. Even when you compact it into a say two and a half hour Shining. Mm-hmm the twist still seems abrupt. Like you have to put slow burn somewhere. So they do that in the shining. And then even when they introduce the, the blood coming out of the elevator, like it Mm. seems like Mm. what is happening? I think um, there's another movie that I'm trying to think of that. I mean, it's just like, it feels for as slow as the movie seems at times, like all of a sudden this huge twist hits you and you're like, what is happening? Mm. But I think that happens a lot more in the quintessential horror films than some of yeah. his, um, I, I, I guess what you call maybe slightly supernatural. Green Mile is, yeah. is a prime example. Stand By Me. Um, Shawshank yep. Redemption yep. is another example where like you have just these little twists that can hit you. And if you don't have to compact six or 700 pages into two hours or an hour and a half or whatever that feature length film is, then maybe you get a slightly better product. Yeah. But all right. So let's, uh, let's talk about some personal mentions. Uh, so I have a few, but Danny, do you have any? Um, I, like I said before, I have probably seen the least, uh, between the three of us, but, uh, some of the, the big ones I've definitely seen. I remember probably one of the earliest ones I've seen in my life was Cujo. Oh, and I thought, oh, nice. I thought, at the time, dogs aren't scary. I was like, "What is this? What is this weird movie about this very normal looking big dog? And yeah. why can't they get out of this car?" But yeah. they they did eventually. You know, they they took the time to 
make the dog seem as menacing as uh, the one from the Sandlot. Like you're actually yeah. seeing what that might have been monstrously. And then um, the ending and in, in the the desperation that they're they're in this car and the kids getting dehydrated and it's really hard when I was a kid to put it all together. But looking back and I've watched it again since then, I was like, oh, this is for for a very obvious and what you might call the monster of the movie just being this large dog. It's it's you know takes an hour and a half to tell me that oh, this is actually kind of scary and. Mm. It, Grips you and takes a, a dog and makes it kind of scary. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go back because I feel like uh, we talked a lot without answering your question um, about do do we think forty eight percent? Yeah, and, is, and yes or no. You know, if you want yeah, to yeah. delve into it, just I curious. I would say, and maybe it's simply given the the breadth of the amount of work that has been adapted from Stephen King novels. Um, I can honestly say, even going through the list of 59, I haven't probably seen half of them. I mean, that's a lot of movies and TV series. And I would say, like, when I hear of something new coming out, it's like, oh, it's a Stephen King adaptation. To me, that doesn't mean, like, oh, it's going to be good. Yeah. Um, So I would say, like, the 48% might be a little on the low end, but I would I feel like they're 50 50. Like, yeah, like the the, the film adaptations are either going to be really, really good, yeah, or really, really bad. Yeah, very few of them are okay. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I there's one I'd never heard of before today when I started looking into things. Uh, the lawnmower man. Lawnmower, you haven't heard of the Lawnmower Man? I have not heard of the Lawnmower Man. Oh, that's right up your alley. You gotta watch Lawnmower Man, book or movie. But I've read into just how extremely different it was from text to movie to the point where Stephen King actually sued the production company for using his name in it. (laughs) Really? And how bastardized the whole thing was from what he actually wrote. I don't know anything about the story that that's based off of, but the movie is... It's it's cult classic status. It's worth a watch. It's really... It's not really a horror movie. It's just kind of the, the worst of early to mid 90s virtual reality movies. It's, oh yeah. From what I saw it looked like reboot in the yeah. in the form of a movie. That's yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's not good. Yeah. You should watch it. You'll like it. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> I think that was the extreme of the difference between book and movie, but yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, it looks And that tends to happen a lot. So, uh Stephen King is also on record as I think that he's kind of softened his approach uh in the last few years, but like he said he hated Kubrick shiny hated it really like, that's not the that's not the story that I wrote oh yeah which is I mean is kind of one of the best horror movies ever made so like oh. um so yeah I mean that tends to happen fairly often yeah, um it's true uh so yeah it's just part of it uh, a couple of my personal mentions um creep show creep show <laughs> uh and then Christine so I watched for the first the first time uh, just this last year, and um, it was one of those that like I just kind of missed growing up, and I yeah. saw it on Voodoo for two bucks, took a chance, and I was like, God, that movie's great. Um, and then uh, Gerald's Game was just, it, I felt like that movie came out of nowhere, didn't know anything about the story. This was one, popped up on Netflix, and was like, boom, Stephen King adapted movie, yay. Yeah. I'm like, that's probably not very good. And then everybody kept talking about it. Oh, Gerald's Game, Gerald's Game, Stephen King, Gerald's Game. So good. Netflix, Gerald's Game. And then I watched it. It's really freaking good. I was going to ask, though, like, in the in the Rotten Tomatoes top five, do you think that there's... And, and we'll get back to kind of some of my personal yeah. mentions. Because actually most of mine I've already mentioned, and they're not horror sure. ones. Um, but do you feel like well, that? Well, yeah, Stand By Me... If that doesn't crack a top five it, it of might, everyone's... It might be my favorite movie ever. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, do you feel like Gerald's Game kind of has some recency bias here? Uh, maybe. It I'm, might. I And I mean, these these were top five, and, and honestly, after 10, probably everything was at least 80%. Let me ask you this. Do you, do you remember where the new It fell? Fairly low. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So yep. it's not necessarily like, hey, we're brushing off Stephen King. Like, mm-hmm. we're dusting him off, we're pulling him back up. Like, yeah. it's, okay, I appreciate that. And we have, we have uh, well, you won't be joining us for the post feature tonight, but we have, we have more to talk about on that spectrum oh. as well, because Josh and I saw Pet Cemetery this week. Oh, you dirty dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So another one that honestly I didn't even know was a Stephen King adaptation was a Secret Window, and that one kind of has a soft spot for me. I know Definitely. it's not super great, it's not super scary, yeah. but it was it was just that prime age for me. I rented that one on my own from the video store. I was super excited about it, and it was scary enough for me at that time in my life. Okay, really liked it. Yeah. I want to I want to get out and and you know what if you if you want to come at me you go ahead and come at me. Um Secret Window. Yeah. is sneaky good. Yeah. John Turturro in that film is unbelievable. The creepy guy with the Amish hat yeah. who keeps popping up and is super creepy. Yeah. Also the guy who has the black foot and Mr. Deeds like <laughs> and also he is in Oh Brother Where Art Thou, my favorite film. Yeah. I love yeah, John yeah, Turturro. And he was incredible in Secret Window. I agree. And most people, I feel like that's kind of one of those films that doesn't need, I feel like there are movies that need Stephen King, but Stephen King needs no one. Yeah. Does that make sense? And so, like, Secret Window, this is one of those films that doesn't need to tout the Stephen King yeah. thing, uh, as well as some of my favorites that aren't necessarily horror. So I feel like if somebody's trying to crack kind of the horror genre and it's this weird, maybe slightly unknown story or an adaptation of a short. They say "Mm," inspired by based on whatever Stephen King, they try to slap his name all over it. But for my honorable mentions, they, I, I I was going to throw out the shining. You have to have a conversation about the shining. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart to hear that he didn't love the movie adaptation. Yeah. I think somewhere I feel like this happened Maybe late '90s, there was another take on it where mm. he was more involved in production, and obviously nobody saw it. I think it was like a made for made for video, like straight to DVD thing or something like that. Okay, I'll have to do more research, but I'm pretty sure there's another version of The Shining that exists that's not Kubrick's version. Really? Yep. So that's and and I think a lot of my love for Stephen King comes from the nostalgia. Yeah. Um, Pet Cemetery, one of the first horror movies I saw after Halloween. You know, like I always go back to Halloween. Pet Cemetery was one of the first because, and actually I saw that one with my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, we rented it. It was a guy's weekend. And it's not, it has a creepiness factor. Um, I would be very, I, I can't wait to see the new one because mm-hmm. I think they they really go after at least in the, at least in the trailer, yeah, they go after the scariness factor, and and I think in the original, call it early '90s, I don't know what it is. It's just not that like it it has creepiness to it. It puts you enough mentally in that place to where you think, oh my god, like the pet dog. Yeah. What if I bury my dog and he comes back and he's not <laughs> he's not the same? You know, like I could have him back, but that might be great for one of my dogs. <laughs> oh, poor Hilly. Oh, anyway, I want Wrigley to come back a little different. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my my favorites, absolutely, Shawshank Redemption. It is such an unbelievable yeah. movie. I lived in Mansfield, Ohio, for a while. Got to got to visit the state pen where they where they filmed all the. I think they filmed the interior shots in Mansfield. Um, unbelievable, um, uh, just an unbelievable story. Unbelievable film adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, Green Mile. Uh, Stand by Me. All of these are just classics. Again, don't necessarily have to stand on the Stephen King part of it. Yeah. But um, you know, uh, to to throw out kind of another classic, one that I saw a little later. Also, so when I first saw The Shining, it was in Colorado. My uncle introduced me to a, my love of horror. I don't think I've ever brought that up before. My uncle lives in Colorado. We would vacation every year. In around July Fourth, mm-hmm. go out for two weeks to Colorado, and uh, he had this little man cave set up in his garage, and we would every night we would watch a horror movie. Nice. And some of them were more like maybe action suspense, verging on horror. We watched. Sure. 
Um, there's one, oh gosh, Josh is going to kill me. We were just talking about it, but it has Alec Baldwin in it. They're running from a bear. Anthony Hopkins is in it. The Edge. It's called The Edge. And it's like, it's kind of scary because there's a bear, but also are bears scary? Yes, bears are scary. But it's, I don't know if it would, I would call it horror, but that's where I first saw The Shining. Um, and that's yeah. first where I saw Carrie. And nice. like, I knew the iconic scenes, but it kind of took, you know, someone having a huge DVD collection. And, you know, at this time, I was not necessarily going to Blockbuster to rent a bunch of horror movies. Mm -hmm. Like, in, in this time of my life, I was kind of doing the more action thing. And so, yeah. um, Carrie was another one that just has a, has a soft spot. Yes, the iconic images certainly hit a nerve, but also it's just kind of, I think, where I saw it, when I saw it, and uh, who I saw it with. So a lot of these films just kind of scratch that nostalgia itch. Yeah, that's awesome. So. Nice. Um, so we actually, uh, in, in chat, uh, we had one comment, Stand By Me Over the Sandlot. I would say that Stand By Me and The Sandlot are shockingly similar movies. Um, they're they're coming-of-age films. Um, I coming, think, coming of age films set in the 50s. Yeah. They feel very similar to me. I think... I think the... I think... You anything anything that remotely has to do with baseball has to be separated because baseball is the most romantic sport, and so you can <laughs> you can agree. when I say romantic, I don't mean like doing your wife during a baseball game. I mean I would do that too. Okay, well, yeah, I do. No, love, I wouldn't because I want to miss. I don't want to miss, <laughs> no, miss the game. I don't want to miss the game. But I but I think it's the most often romanticized sport. I think yeah. it also scratches that nostalgia itch. Um, and Stand By Me is really just truly delving into the coming of age film, the 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 classic three or four person friend group yep. going on an adventure, and maybe we need to see we need to do a baseball episode. Oh, how many baseball horror movies are there out there? I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know that they have to exist. I would argue it's not a horror movie. Uh oh, but we could make an argument. Field of Dreams. Baseball oh, and ghosts. Baseball and ghosts. Yep. ghosts. Yep. You got it. It's one. not scary, but <laughs> Andy might actually come if we watch Field of Dreams. <laughs> but but I think yeah, they they are similar movies in the sense of they're set in the same time. But yeah. but I think but I, I think the friend dynamic. I think what they're accomplishing. Just the fact that there are four friends setting out. Yes, there 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 are friend groups setting out to accomplish a task. Blah 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 blah. But stand by me specifically. Hey. Let's go find this dead body that we've been told about. Like, yeah. how it just un sounds like, like something so close to what me and my friends would. Have oh my like. gosh, <laughs> the 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 bridge scene with the train. Like, yep. I, there's just there's so many parts. Well, that, I mean, Will Wheaton before oh Star Trek. Oh my gosh, yes, when and River Phoenix. I mean, there's just yeah. Oh, and the guy I don't know his name, but he turns out to be. Really good looking, but he's the chubby kid who can't find his pennies buried <laughs> under his back deck. Like, yeah. okay, they lost my pennies. Like, it's just every every friend group has that friend. Oh, like, yeah. You know? oh, yeah. I don't know. It's, Scott so. Miller, man, you're probably not listening, but if you do, shout out to you. <laughs> That's your friend. Yep. I think mine was Eric. Oh, Cannon. I've told you so. Oh, much I know Scott. Scott. I know Scott. I love Scott so much. I, I. We need to, I need to bring him up here and put him on the podcast. It'd be fun. Yeah, I, I think for, for our friend group, it was probably Eric. He, uh, he's that classic guy that you felt bad if you didn't share your food with. <laughs> <laughs> that meant he was never paying. So, so he was always forgetting his pennies. Anyway, we've, we, we digress. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> All right, Dan, you have any just uh, other thoughts on, on Stephen King stuff? Anything we haven't given you a chance to talk about yet? We talk uh, a lot. That's cool. Oh, that's quite all right. It's, I'm, I feel like I learn as much as everybody else when I'm on this show. <laughs> uh, probably the one I think that stood out from a lot of the entries that I read into today that I think is kind of split among the fan base of Stephen King is uh, The Mist. Oh. Mm. I really like The Mist movie. Okay. I think, you know... Scene to scene, it's maybe not the best written or anything like that. But when it comes to a movie with some well-made original creatures to it, it's it's a 
very cool in that sense. You get a very good look at most of those monsters. Sorry, I. We need someone else to monitor chat. We got. All right, Polar Knights. I love Cubs. They are so cute trying to play. Hey, we won today. Who are these people? <laughs> Is he making a joke about how bears aren't scary? No, he's making a joke about my Cubs hat. <laughs> <laughs> bears aren't scary. God. Bears if you watch The scary. Edge, if they get a taste of blood, they're scary. <laughs> all right, Polar Knights. I, I still like you. It's it's okay. Me too. It's all right. But, yeah. Well, I got... I, yeah, I got a Cubs hat, but this guy's over here in his Indians hat. So if you want to talk about the Indians, too, you, you know, equal opportunity uh, hazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of hazing, the mist sucks, Danny. The mist. <laughs> that movie's terrible. <laughs> but I can't, I can't say I've seen the movie since 2007. Out. <laughs> Sorry. But. Some really cool visuals in the movie at the first, especially for the time. Uh, some very Orwellian looking creatures throughout the movie. Sure. And then an ending that I read today was actually praised by Stephen King as far as in comparison to his ending in which it's mm. kind of just a uh, unanswered, we're going into the mist and we'll see what happens. This movie ends with, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, the mercy uh, killing of... Yeah. Uh, several of the main characters, and then the immediate realization that help was right around the corner. It was very brutal. I thought it was a pretty extreme ending, but in 2007. Let me ask you this, and this is a this is just off the top of my head. Sorry, I'm so engaged in chat right now. Go ahead, Polar Knights, Indians. You gotta love them. The best of the best of the elite. The, well, we didn't win. In 97, we didn't win in 95, we didn't win in 16. Don't know if I would say the best of the best of the elite, but maybe this is our year. That's what we say Some, every year. Somehow we're going to, this is going to merge into a horror and baseball I've, podcast. I've, I've been a lifelong, for those who don't know, <laughs> lifelong Indians fan, uh, lifelong Browns fan, lifelong, well, Ohio State Buckeyes is not, yeah, I'm not, I guess it's not too bad, but. Yeah, it's a Cleveland sports. It's painful. It's my burden to bear, but got to love them. Oh, my. Chicago sports can be just as painful. Yeah, you guys broke a curse, though. Anyway. Talk yeah. about scary movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Talk about back. scary movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I want to I want to pose this question. I don't know where we are on time. So if we're out of time on this, maybe we just leave this question hanging. But would you say a more extreme? So we, we figured out that... that um, Stephen King, we, we've based it down to roughly 50-50. Would you say a more extreme version of Stephen King? Now, I know that this is we're not getting into written works necessarily. Just staying with film. Yeah. A more extreme version is M. Night Shyamalan a Ding Dong. For those who don't know who I'm referencing, M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> you some for translating. Thank you for translating. Pretty sure that you Okay, well, I'll just... <laughs> hey. We get, hey, if my wife... Listens to this, she is not going to know who M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong is. <laughs> she also won't know who M. Night Shyamalan is, <laughs> and she will not think that they're probably two different people. But, <laughs> but, but when I when I when I think about the story arcs that a lot of their films take, mm-hmm. um, some of the some of the topics they try to tap into, some of which are extremely maybe outlandish, to the almost very practical. Of like the unbroken or unbreakable. I'm yeah. sorry, unbroken is a different movie. I, unbreakable. Well, like I, I don't know. And maybe, I see the comparison you're trying to make. Am it, I off? If would, I'm if I'm off the reservation, I don't even know that you are, and you probably shouldn't say it that. But hey, I I'm Cherokee. So we're moving on. Um, so uh, I understand the 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 comparison you're trying to make. I just feel like it would hurt me in my soul. To say that M. Night could potentially be the next Stephen King or has the has has similar qualities to that of a Stephen King. But if I guess if I'm just looking at the movies just film adaptation. Just film adaptation. Just which I know, movies. Which I know I'm saying like hey, film, Stephen King has nothing to do with. Right. M. Night has everything to do with. Right. So it's it's a hard it's not so, a yeah, it's not when, a one. Whenever, whenever you get to that place, I can I can see what you mean by like 
Name name recognition. Yeah, and in general, name recognition. They're either yeah. great or they're bad. Yep. Like, yeah. I would say at this point, earlier in my life, M Night Sham, let's go, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Now I'm like zero percent, fifty fifty. But it's the extreme. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like Stephen King. What was like, the what was the recent more recent one that? Ooh, I already forget. I mean, oh, uh, Split. Split. Or the the Split one that glass. mashes all of them. Yeah, glass. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, and then also he did the visit. Yep, which was shockingly good. I mean, yeah, you know. So yeah, um, sorry. No, you're good. Uh, we sh- we should probably move into our feature. We've already yeah. been talking for half an hour, so you know what it is time for. Boot baseball. <laughs> and now for our feature presentation. All right. So uh, this week we are going to be watching Pet Cemetery. But not 2019 Pet Cemetery. Please. Because I just watched that on Saturday. So we're going to be watching uh, 1989 Pet Cemetery. Uh, so, for those of you that do not know, Pet Cemetery is a 1989 American horror film. It's an adaptation of Stephen King's 1983 novel of the same name. It is directed by Mary Lambert, written by Stephen King. The film features Dale Midkiff, Denise Crosby, Blaze, Berta. Uh, she plays, um, oh shoot, what's her name? Ellie. Bird. Um, and I, I feel bad about this one because I saw this guy at a panel at Horror Hound, and I still don't know how you pronounce his first name. Uh, I believe it is Michael Hughes. Okay. Um, so he plays a uh, little guy. Yeah. Gosh, why, why can't I think of any of these characters' call names? Call him Todd. It's not <laughs> Todd. It's not Todd. Um, does anybody know in the in chat? No, they don't. Okay, that's fine. Um, so go with Todd. <laughs> it's not Todd. We'll fix it whenever we get there. Anyway, so he was like, ah, uh, gosh, like I think younger than two when they made this movie. Really? Yeah. So why was he even on the panel? Like, uh, just pooping my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Well, like they asked some questions <laughs> to <laughs> to the panel, and they were like, "Hey, so like, I mean, you know, like, did any of you like read Pet Cemetery before you found out you were in Pet Cemetery? Well, obviously not you. Yeah, I hope your parents negotiated <laughs> your contract real well. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, he was he seemed like a really nice guy. Um, and then uh, Fred Gwynn as uh, Victor Pascal, who was also on the panel that day in Horror Hound. It was really cool. Um, so, yeah, uh, I have seen this version of Pet Cemetery, but it was a very long time ago. <sighs> um, and so then I saw the more recent one, and I'm excited to see the original one more time. Um yeah, I won't. I won't say much more else. Uh, Danny, you want to read us our uh, back of the box? Oh yeah. For most families, moving in. Let me see, oh, man. For most families, moving is a new beginning. But for the creeds, it could be the beginning of end, because they've just moved in next door to a place that children built with broken dreams, the pet cemetery. It's a tiny patch of land that hides a mysterious Native American burial ground with the powers of resurrection. Yeah, keep going. Master of the macabre, Stephen King will take you and the creeds to hell and back. But the creeds don't have return tickets. Your tour guide is kindly old Judd Crandall, the neighborhood nice guy who knows the secrets of life, but has seen enough to firmly believe that sometimes dead is better. All right, guys, uh, we'll be back uh, in about an hour and 40-ish minutes. Uh, We'll give you our uh, thoughts on Pet Cemetery. Um, To Pet Cemetery! To To Pet Pet Cemetery. Cemetery!